Good morning, Bella Vista, and visitors. And welcome to the Bella Vista Missionary Baptist Church K Academy Cat class. Uh, my name is Michael Allen, and this is Sister Queen Martin. Queen Martin. And we are having lesson 12 today, lesson 12. And our lesson 12 is impact the culture, setting examples, pointing others to freedom. And this is what it's all about, impacting the culture. Sister Martin. OK, I'm going to start for you. We're going to do our prayer? Yes, ma'am. Oh, Father in heaven, oh, Lord Jesus Christ, oh, Father God, we just want to say thank you, God, for blessing us, Father, to meet one more time, oh, Lord. Oh, Father God, just thank you, Father, for the excitement, Father, that we have for this class. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for, for what you have done, God, what you're going to do, oh, Lord. And please, Father God, just let what we do and say be, Father, for the glorification of your people. Let it help somebody, Father, and let it help somebody, God, but for your glorification, oh, Lord. God, we just thank you, Lord, once again, Father, for this opportunity, Father, to, to impact your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hello everyone. We're excited. Uh, we've made it. This is the last chapter in the book. This is chapter 12. In this section, uh, level four is titled Give Back. And as Brother Allen just stated, we're talking about impact the culture. Because we know as Christians that uh, God doesn't have us here just for ourselves. It's always about serving his people. Mm -hmm. So uh, the broader goal is to make a difference in the financial lives within our society. So we have talked about taking it from ourselves to our family, to our community, and now today we're talking about just impacting everyone anywhere in the culture or in the society. So some of our learning goals, uh, the first thing we need to know is, and you all have heard this before, if it is to be, it is to, it's up to me. So we can't look around at other people and say, oh, this needs to be done or that needs to be done. No, if it is to be, it's up to me. I have to be part of the uh, solution. The next thing is what we want you to feel. Hopefully you feel grateful and thankful that uh, God has allowed us to get this information, to these, use these resources, that the church has, um, realized that this is a need that needed to be addressed. And so this stewardship class has uh, been allowed to happen and you've been able to view the lessons and participate in the, the uh, opportunity to get your financial foundation better. And then do for doing, we want you to continue to search God's word for encouragement to continue this journey to financial freedom. Because we know these last few months that we've been talking with you and that you've been reading your materials and listening to us that we haven't gotten everything straight where it needs to be. So it's a continuous journey. So, and it's a journey that we can't make by ourselves. You know, we need God to help us. So we've given you scriptures every week. And what we want you to do is review those scriptures and also you can just search God's word for yourself to find other scriptures that can help you. So, um, I'm just going to repeat the same prayer that we said last week because it's still talking about impacting others. Dear God, I still have so many plans, dreams, and goals. Help me remember that I can be a blessing to others even while I'm working on myself. And as always, this is in Jesus' name, amen, because we have sent our prayers through Jesus. And before I turn it over to uh, Brother Allen, I just wanted to let you all know, many times, you know, we sit back and say, I know when I first uh, got this information, I kept saying, oh, I wish I had known, where was this 10 years ago, five years ago, all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But we can't cry over spilled milk. And if y'all were ever around your grandparents, I know y'all heard that. Don't cry over spilled milk. You cannot put it back in the carton. We have to start from where we are now and move forward. Your past journey has been to prepare you for where God wants you to go now. Learn the lessons from the past, don't regret them. You know that I wish I had mindset. It, it doesn't help us, it keeps us stuck. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Brother Allen. Yes, ma'am. And today, our scripture, Bible scripture that we're reading from today is Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse nine and 10. And then later on, we're gonna look back. Uh, one of the scriptures that we referred to earlier in our lessons is Luke chapter four, verse 18 and 19. 
but we're going to start with uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 9, and 10. And they read, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. But if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he had not another to help him. And 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 y'all know when when I was when I started to study this lesson and was studying for the lesson for the week that whenever whenever I read this scripture, I always read to say two are better than one, and I always read the two are better than one because when the one falls, the other one can help him up. But we always looked over that last part of of uh, verse nine. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. And what we've been talking about, labor, and what includes labor? Labor is finances. You get, you know, that's why we do our labor as far as in the world. But our labor in the churches, is, that's why we do our labor for what God wants us to do. But it's for our labor. And that means you have to do some work. Uh, you know, so it comes back, whenever you think about labor, we talk about faith. But what is faith? What does that scripture say? Faith without, without works, works. <laughs> are dead. Yes. So you just can't say it. No. I mean, and and and, and y'all know. Uh, I'm sorry. I I'm, I'm almost like a. Uh, I remember. I remember a uh, sister How. You know, and and, and now I'm talking to I was people who've been here a while. I remember sister How, and she was a Sunday school teacher. She was a, uh, but she was a uh, kindergarten teacher. Mm -hmm. and that was her. That was her. What she did at, at the school in the elementary school. And I always, it always come back to me, y'all. I'm a high school teacher, a uh, high school teacher, Sunday school teacher. And I always, you know, I, when, I, when I used to look at the, the labor and the impact, mm -hmm. what I always used to do in, in teaching our class, I always would think that God, whatever I go through in my life, uh, bless me to have opportunities that I can come and teach these young people and show them hope and show them a, a better way and show them what God can do before they get out into the world. And, I, and you know, since I always think, I, you know, and it, it, it was I always to think that the senior high Sunday school class is the last stop mm -hmm. before they get to where they add us and they don't have to go to Sunday school. Mama don't tell them, you're not in mama house. Once you, once you leave, you know, they're going off to college or whatever. And that's what I used to always think. This is the last, if, I, if we can't get them now, wow. we might miss them. And, and y'all, that's how, you know, that's how I always used to teach. And I guess when I, when I talk, that's why I always used to think about those young children because I wanted to get, and wanted to get those children before they left home and before they get out into the world and before they, I mean, and, and why you still have that hope. And, and, and y'all, and I know I, I'm, we teach it to everybody, mm -hmm. but I always thought about the, our youngsters because, you know, that hope because they don't, you know, even though they, even though they have life, but you always say, when I graduate from high school, <laughs> what's the opportunities? Right. You know, you can go to college, just like what you just said. Don't cry over spill milk. Mm -hmm. You know, don't, don't cry over that. You know, you have to go. And they, and they, they don't have a lot of spilled milk at this point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have that hope to what we can do. And if you can get them and if they can start good habits and godly habits before they start the worldly habits, then you don't have those problems. You don't have to work. If you know you don't have those problems, if you learn how to do it up front, you know. And and like I say, I used to always tell the children that. And 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 I hate to say it, but not well. I don't hate to say it. I used to always like to, to do things that would specifically influence our children. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going. I used I used to love to tell the children. You know, they ask, "What do you do?" I'm saying, "Well, I'm an engineer for NASA." And then, you know, of course you start to real. You start talking about rockets and astronauts and all of this different stuff. And you could tell them children what, and then they could say, oh, that's what, that's what trigonometry, that's why you can use trigonometry. Oh, that's what calculus is for. Right. You know what I mean? And they could start seeing those stem. Make it real we, to them. Make it real to them. Mm -hmm. So they could see how to do it. And they know that it works. And then you start realizing, and they mind, you can see the, you can see the, when, the when the lights would finally go on. And you could see that light switch going on in them children's store. Oh, that's what you could use that for. Oh, that's what you could do with that. And it's real to them. Mm -hmm. And when it's real to them, they mind start to open up. And that box open up. And it's no longer a closed box. 
But it opened up. You know what? And I remember about English, and, and I'm going to get back to the class. I remember English. I always, I always liked math and I always liked science. I hated English. But you know, you know what got me in, in English when I was, in, when I was in, at TSU t taking a, uh, uh, taking my, uh, God dog, descriptive, my descriptive writing. Mm. Okay. And then you start, and then start to write, and then start thinking about, hmm, writing and the way you, the way you write procedures, you have to be able to write this to where mm -hmm. Everybody can understand. And when you start to write it, and now at NASA, right now I'm a quality engineer, and, and when you write up, when you have problems, and you can see problems, and you can write each problem out and detail what, what goes where, and, the, and people look at it, and I always like to say, I like for when, when you read my reports, the only thing you do when you see the reports, you look at it, you read it. Okay. I don't want to hear nothing else. You just say, okay, because you done did all your fact checking. You done did everything you need to do, and then you can see that's what it is. And that's what we hope that you all are getting from this class, that you all are able to, we want to make it real to you, like you said. It's where you can see the benefit of it in your life, you know, where you can use it. So once you start doing, using some of the concepts and doing some of the things, then the lights come on, and then you say, okay, that's why it's important. That's what I miss. That's what I need to be doing. Those types of things. Right. And, 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 that's, and that's what our author was talking about this morning. Give back, you know, and teach and teach. But one of, one of, the, things that, one of the things that they said that, uh, that really, that, and, and the author said this morning, that really did get to me. He was saying that, that people outside were saying that the, uh, do we realize, or be honestly, do the church really need to be doing this? Is this what the church really needs to be doing? Is this, the, is this the church's prime example that what we should, should we be teaching financial uh, stewardship? I mean, you know, you talk about giving, and, and when the culture look at us and look at the church, and, and if we go back to what was said early, early by our author, he was saying that you're supposed to have a car. You are supposed right. to have a car like a preacher, a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. You know, then he went about a Cadillac right. that he couldn't afford. <laughs> it made him feel good, but how it was messing up his finances. And that's when, when, when the world looks at us, at the church, you know, all that the old church talk about is giving. Oh, we giving all that money to the preacher. And the thing about it, though, the reality of it, when we make it real, mm -hmm. we doing what God told us to do. This is what God told us to do. It's like it say, well, well, one or two in your labor. We say, if you fall mm -hmm. in your labor. Because just think about it. If a person is saved at 12 years old, and I mean, we have people who are saved at 12 years old. I remember Abraham talk about how he was called so early in his ministry to preach, and he started to preach. A Reverend Tolman, when he talk about being under Reverend, Reverend Abraham, talking about how they used to call him church boy. When you know what God wants you to do mm -hmm. and start doing what God wants you to do at an early age, then you know what your labor is, what your job is. You know what God wants you to do. That's right. That's just like, that's just like, the, just like me. One of the things I love to do the most, sister, you, and you know, I always tell you, I, I love riding a tractor. <laughs> I rode a tractor yesterday for, well, four hours. I love riding a tractor, cutting the yard. But at the same time, the, my first love is Sunday school and with my high school Sunday school class. Mm -hmm. That was my first love, to teach our children about God and about what God can do. That's our first love, and that's what we're supposed to do. And, 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 that's, and that comes back to making an impact on our culture, what we're supposed to be doing to make an impact on our culture. And again, sister, that's what it say, well, well, one or two. And then one of the one of the last things in the book. That really that that, that got me also. It says that the uh, <laughs> the financial state of many church attendees and people who live in neighborhoods surrounding Church qualifies them to be described as poor, prisoners, blind, and oppressed. We may wear, mm -hmm. we may wear our Sunday best as small as those sitting on the pew next to us, but beneath this pleasant veneer, 
we find individuals struggling to survive, overwhelmed by desperation caused by their finances. Amen. And y'all know it, this is not even true in our neighborhood right now. Because in our neighborhood right now, outside of Bella Vista, where we used to, where we used to, a lot of our people used to live, right now the, uh, the average price of new homes going up in this area, is a, is a, and by the way, y'all, for, for folks in Houston, we know what the heights is, but we are the <laughs> independent heights. Mm -hmm. And the average price of a house in this neighborhood right now is going for $250,000. Yes, it is. $250,000. And you know, and I'm going to say something else. Lowest. Even with interest rates, as low as they are right now, and we're talking about you can get interest rates in the two, mm -hmm. two and a half, two and three eighths, up to three and a half, and you got excellent rates. Ex I mean, those are excellent rates. Right. We still having a hard time mm -hmm. in our neighborhood. And, and when the book was written, it was said that describe the people in our neighborhood. So, 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 this is, so, this, so this is so relevant to how we impact our people, mm -hmm. how God wants us to impact our people and what he wants us to do. And uh, I mean, so this is the, like I said, this, this is why this is so important for what we do and the way we study and what we teach our people. And again, it's, uh, it's not enough time, but we really just, we have to do the best we can. Uh, I'm done. So yeah, we basically, and, and like you were saying about, Brother Allen was saying about, you know, people may question whether we should be teaching financial literacy, stewardship at this level and things like that. But God is concerned about the whole person and all aspects of our lives. And all aspects of our life affect each other. When we're struggling financially, then we cannot be good stewards within the church. We cannot support the church programs. We don't feel, uh, we're not feeling our best emotionally and mentally, so we're not able to teach the Sunday school class or sing in the choir and, and do those types of things. And uh, as our pastor was saying, uh, teaching, even preaching in our services, the series he's in about the mask, you know, we're wearing the mask instead of being real because we don't want to be vulnerable, we don't want to be shamed, we don't people, want people to think we're imperfect. But we say all the time, there's none perfect but the Father. We know this, there's none good but the Father, so we know we're imperfect people, but we still don't want to, we still want to wear that mask and act like we're perfect. But you'll never get better if we continue wearing the mask. We have to, we have to admit our imperfections and where we need help. So, um, one of the things that uh, we're supposed to be doing when we impact the culture as far as setting examples and pointing others to freedom, well, first of course, you have to start with yourself. You have to get on the right track. And we talked about, like uh, Brother Allen, about having a, a prayer partner, right? Mm -hmm. Your prayer partner is more than just somebody to pray with. Right. Your prayer partner is an accountability partner. Now, uh, your prayer partner should be able to be honest and upfront with you to be able to say, you know that you can't afford that, you know mm -hmm. you need to pay your bills on time, you need to, you know you need to go to work, you know, but we don't want people saying those types of things. Well then you don't really have a true prayer accountability partner if right. a person cannot do those types of things with you. We're here to help to relieve the pressures of the pressure of financial oppression. Mm -hmm. Our deepest longings, of course, can only be satisfied through the love of God, not the love of money or material things. And unfortunately, we have too many people, including people in the church and people who profess to be Christians, who are searching to feel something within themselves through money and material things. But we know that can't be happen. So this is very important. And then when we're talking about impacting the culture, we have to take the church beyond the four walls of the mm -hmm. building and embrace all people, races, ethnic ethnicities, ages, genders, and financial levels. And it's not just people who are making minimum wage or working part-time or unemployed or something who need financial literacy. We have people who are making a lot of money. And I know you've seen people hit the lottery. You've seen mm. professional athletes and all kinds of people that still have financial trouble and problems because they're not handling it correctly. So financial literacy is for everybody. And because we are the church, we know that God has us to serve everybody. So 
you know, it's open. And in the book, uh, he even talked about how they were doing their classes in Spanish because there's an mm -hmm. influx of uh, Spanish speaking people in their community. So, you know, we have to be open. We have to bridge the gap between the church and the community by addressing the needs of people to improve their financial life. And that's, a, that's another way to outreach because sometimes a person who has financial needs, they may be so concerned about their financial need or stressed about how I'm gonna pay rent or how I'm gonna put food on the table that, you know, uh, they, they, when you invite them to church, they just kind of blow it off because they feel like they have something more important they need to do. But when they see the church in us because we're willing to help them, we're mm -hmm. reaching out to help them, then that can be an outreach method and a way that we can uh, show them uh, the love of Jesus, and then maybe we can then get their ear and they will listen to what it is that we have to say. Mm -hmm. So we let them see the love of Jesus, not just hear about it. Mm -hmm. Because when somebody's in, I don't know if you've ever had a situation where people were telling you certain things and you just didn't want to hear it at that time because of what you were going through. Well, that's what happens uh, many times when with uh, people that we're trying to reach out to. So um, another verse that the, um, that's in our lesson is Hebrews 13 and 16. Mm -hmm. And the NIV says, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. And our ultimate goal has to be about pleasing God. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we don't want to say things to other people, even when we know we can say things that would be beneficial to them because we don't think that they will accept it. Uh, you know, they don't wanna, they already know that they're in trouble and they don't wanna hear us telling them. But that becomes a requirement from us, from God. It's a right. requirement to us from God. We have to do good, we have to share with others what we know is right. Mm -hmm. And yes, it may um, not be comfortable, but this is a requirement. This is what God expects of us. And, um, then this one that I, I really like, well, first I'll say, where will you be this time next year? Okay, last summer, believe me, we did not think we would be in nope. a uh, <laughs> pandemic, nope. social nope. distancing, wearing masks, you know, nope. and a lot of people wondering if we can send our kids to school, you know, all of these types of things that are going on. But okay, so where do you expect to be next year? I mean, look mm. at it from the pandemic aspect, but also look at it from your financial aspect. Uh, are your bills being paid on time? Are you mm. making enough money? What is your credit rating? You know, those type, do you have a savings account? If you, you know, if there, there are things that you need to be putting in place. Mm -hmm. Right now. Starting right now, mm -hmm. this time next year, because we know time passes whether we're doing something or not. What's, what's, what's your situation going to be? So if we're able to talk with you all and say, okay, well, you remember last August of 2020, you know, this is where we were, so where are you now, August of 2021? We want to be able to say that you're better. And then where will you be in five years, you know? We have to, we do have to plan. We know God is taking care of everything and he doesn't want us to worry about anything, but he still wants us to be good stewards of everything that he gives us as it relates to time, talent, resources, and opportunities. Mm -hmm. So, um, in Acts 17 and 6, mm -hmm. I, I like this verse. It said, these men whom have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And they were talking about the apostles that, right. that, that came and they were saying, uh, it reminded me of John Lewis. That's yeah. why I like that. <laughs> it said, <Good> trip. <laughs> Christians yeah. are called to be more than good people. Right. We are called to make a difference. Right. And sometimes when we say good people, we're looking at, we're defining it by the world standard. Mm -hmm. And what the world calls good people may not even, it's not gonna be good by God's standard. So we need Christians who are willing to change the culture, inspire people and disturb them. We have to disturb people. Right. Be like you say, John Lewis said, what do you tell him? Let's get into some what? Some good trouble. Let's get into some good <laughs> trouble. So yeah. All trouble, not bad. So mm -hmm. sometimes we need, you know, people call trouble because they are uncomfortable with what you're telling them, but mm -hmm. it's the right thing. So we need to start some good trouble. Uh, we want to break and eliminate the cultures. In our culture, we have a lot of different uh, cultures that just aren't necessarily godly. And they talked about seven different cultures that we have. 
It's uh, first the culture of greed. Mm -hmm. Ooh wee, y'all know about the culture of greed, don't you? Yeah. Um, so in the culture of greed is why in the 1980s with the housing market, we had that big crash, you know, mm -hmm. because they were <laughs> putting people in houses they knew they couldn't afford, right. giving them a low interest rate at the beginning, knowing that they were going to go up to a higher interest rate. Balloon payments. Yeah, the balloon payments and mm -hmm. all that stuff, and people were going to not be able to pay it and lose it. But they didn't care because what happened? The banks got rich. The, right. They made their money. They got all their bonuses, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. And so basically the culture of greed causes people to also abandon family responsibilities sometimes to earn more money. Mm -hmm. It causes us to buy more clothes than we can wear, store mm -hmm. them in basements and attics. And then sometimes we even rent storage units to store stuff that uh, just keep them buying more and more things. We have replaced the cultures of modesty, sufficiency, and frugality with the culture of greed. Right. When this culture interacts with one of the other cultures below, it produces a culture of debt. That's we start getting in debt more and more to buy things to keep up with what's going on in the culture. Then the next one is the culture of impatience, and I actually saw this one come to life during my lifetime. No longer do we have a culture of delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to, I actually did it even with my kids. I put stuff in layaway. You know, school clothes went into layaway, you know, at the end of right. the school year. So, for the, so by the time uh, school started, you know, you have been paid it off and get, get the clothes out. Oh, we can't do that anymore. We're paying for stuff with a credit card because we don't want to wait. Right. And so, be, you know, we've become a plastic society. We make payments for a purchase before we obtain the money, you know. We just use the plastic credit card because we want things right now. We want things right now. Uh, people, we have road rage because people don't want to wait at traffic mm -hmm. lights and, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we want fast food. You go to the fast food restaurant, you're not even cooking, they're still complaining about how fast people get the food out there. You know, all kinds of things. So we've become an impatient culture. Mm -hmm. Then we have a culture of, uh, they call it ignorance. It said we, we seem to be comfortable with a culture of ignorance as if ignorance is really bliss. You know, they say what you don't know won't hurt you. That's not true. Not true. We do know that that is not true. <laughs> yeah. The truth is what we don't know can kill us. That's it right. has become acceptable to know more about celebrities than our own lives. So we're not paying attention to what's going on in our own house because we're right. watching all this stuff on TV and living their life and things like that. So we need to get out, out of that. Then the culture of fantasy. Uh, celebrity worship depicts a culture of fantasy that allows right. make-believe to become our reality. So uh, we don't want to do that. It offers emotional and psychological support to misplaced priorities and processes. Like millions of kids who really believe they will play professional basketball or football and they don't need an education. Mm -hmm. Millions of families believe some miracle will occur that will enable them to pay bills for which they lack money. Their purchases make them feel like they are part of a world they can imagine, and thus their debt facilitates their fantasy. So then we have a culture of denial, just period. We live in a constant state of denial about so many things. We are in denial about our children and their behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was never, I know I'll say this, but you know, some of y'all may not agree, but uh, somebody asked me one time when I was teaching at Prairie View about uh, do we have ADD and ADHD and I know it's a real thing and there are some people that are really uh, diagnosed with it but mm -hmm. I told them no because my mama had a BELT and she <laughs> yeah. we, we, uh, we you know when she said sit down I knew she meant sit down so a lot of uh, <laughs> times you know we just uh, start blaming giving excuses I'll say for other things that are going on so we are we're in denial Instead of dealing with what's really going on, we just deny it and make up excuses. Then we have the culture of victimhood. And we know that uh, in some situations, some instances in our society, people are victims of things. But everything is not uh, a conspiracy theory and a ripoff and somebody else's fault. So stop playing the victim. And even if you are, rise above it and find a way to, get, to overcome it. Mm -hmm. And the last one is the culture of prosperity. Um, mm. There was a time when purpose, significance, and service were celebrated as virtues worth pursuing and possessing. Mm -hmm. Instead, now we're looking at the life of the rich and famous and thinking that that's the way to go. That's so, 
uh, prosperity is often mistakenly and narrowly defined as simply having money and possessions. And that's not true prosperity. It's not the prosperity that God wants us to have. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like uh, Brother Allen was saying, it's a lot to try to cover. But just to just put some things on your mind, uh, if you have the, the book, please continue to read it. Uh, this is... This is chapter 12, which is the last chapter in our book. And uh, next week, we're going to try to do a <laughs> make it real <laughs> a summary that makes it real. Yeah, so turn yeah. it back over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and sister, you know, I'm a, uh, I was thinking about that, that, that English class that I was talking about was technical writing. Okay. When I started talking, I mm -hmm. forgot, forgot the name. It's technical, right, technical writing class. Technical. And I'm going to uh, use that B-E-L-T. I hope the people... You know, like you say, you catch that when you go home. Be what the B E L T is. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, one lastly, and like you say, since this is our last lesson, and and uh, I see our people saying we going over, over time. The uh, Dr. Soros wrote one last thing to y'all that that that's most one of the most important things that he said about this book. It says while while Hollywood, Madison Avenue, and other centers of media and entertainment power effectively entice us to seductive marketing. They do not have the ultimate source of power, mm -hmm. the love of God, and the transformation power of the gospel. They may have money, technology, and human talent, but they cannot draw on the supernatural strength of the creator of the universe like we can. Amen. And that's the bottom line is that only what you do for God is going to last. Only what you do for Christ is going to last. This is, we talk about finances, and like, you, like we say, it's hard. To, you, want, you don't want to cross that line and get in somebody's business. and get in, But the ultimately is faith without works is dead, and only what we do for Christ will last. And, 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 and that's what it is. And if we can have that, if we can manage our finances, we can manage our life Amen. through the Holy Spirit because he tells us, you know, he'll tell you, don't go this way. Okay, don't go. He, if we be obedient to his word, what does it say? Obedience is better than sacrifice. And this is, what, this is, a, this is a Sunday school lesson, y'all. This is about God. It's, we talk about finances, but this is about being obedient to God. And we're in on that one. Yes. Oh, Father in heaven, oh, Lord Jesus Christ, oh, Father God, we know, God, that, that only what we do for you will last, oh, Lord. Because, Father, we know, God, one day, Father, that we won't, when we open our eyes, Father, it won't be on this side of, 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 of the world, God, but we'll be on the other side, Father. And, God, that we'll have to answer to you, O oh Lord. Yes, Everything Lord. that we did, Father, all our finances, all the words that we said, Lord, Father, we'll be judged by you, O oh Lord. And, Father, God, our motives on what we did and why we did things, God. So, Father... Just bless us, Father, Please, that Lord. anything can be out of this class that we said, Father. Blessed God be for your glory, O oh Lord. Father, we're not trying to no little eyes and big you, O oh Lord. We're just trying to say what thus said the Lord, O oh Lord. And, Father, we know, God, that if, if we, like your word says, if, you if you be held high, Father, you will draw all men unto you, O oh Lord. So if you be lifted up, Father, all men will be drawn to you, O oh Lord. So, God, we just thank you, Lord, for thank this opportunity. You. Lord, we love you, Father, and God, we can't do it without you, Father. And we know, God, that if you be for us, it ain't nothing, Father, that we cannot do. Oh, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We love you. And, Father, we just want to say thank you, Lord, for all things. And, Father, all these blessings, Father, we just want to ask in the name of your mighty son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus', Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen.